you know, presenting things for us to have a conversation because um, I don't know if neuroscience is yet at that place that can really solve it all or answer all of the questions. But I do know that, you know, America, we have a huge problem with addiction and substance use. I mean, there are over 30 million people who have a substance use disorder, and that's not counting the people who have problematic use, who, you know, misuse in other ways. And not being a policy person, you know, this issue of drugs and drug policy, pol drug policies clearly impact the work that I do, um, even if my, my fundamental um, focus is understanding the neurobiology, so that yes, we can try to um, develop treatments. But, you know, we start off with the fact, as I said, America is definitely a drug country, no matter what state you're in, every single substance under the Sun is, you know, used and uh, misused, you know, in in the U.S. And this has huge repercussions, obviously, on our healthcare system being under siege. And I don't think a lot of people understand how much money goes into um, treating substance use disorder from a healthcare standpoint, and obviously the economic burden that it, it carries. And even though there are treatments for a number of substance use disorders, they're not used or may not be suitable. And of course, they're not ideal um, as yet. And, you know, we'll talk about, you know, the aspects of overdose deaths that are in this country, but a huge problem for me on so many aspects of substance use disorders, whether you're a neurobiologist, whether you're, you're a, a clinical caregiver, a personal caregiver, whether you're a lawyer, judge, there are aspects of stigma that really impacts on these, these disorders. And it's not just the individual, it's the family, the community, and the country. The burden is really overwhelming. And I don't think that a lot of people realize that just how much this burden on, an, uh, on every single level, and of course, economically, because the US has spent trillions of dollars um, on substance use disorders. We know it's a huge issue because you know we are in a, an overdose epidemic um, that yes started with um, opiate prescriptions that went to heroin and now to you know um, this terrible um, I call it poison fentanyl these synthetic um, opioids and of course COVID increased substance use. Um, significantly as people were isolated and the isolation stress that that, you know, um, led to. So, you know, for me, when I thought about the question um, or Marta, you know, to say to come and talk about drug policy and neuroscience uh, of addiction, for me, it was like, how did we get here? You know, and really, what is the neuroscience? You know, what is it that neuroscience and the relevance of neuroscience to all of this? So, I go back to you know drugs and policy, and a lot of this really started, as most of you know, in the war on drugs, and the war on drugs escalated dramatically, you know, from the 1970s, the increase in the number of people who are incarcerated, and it was really um, President Nixon and his administration, and you know there was a, um, I'm, again, some of you most you know know. John Ehrlich's in his, his testament, testimony, I should say, you know, where he stated that they knew they couldn't make it legal, meaning drugs to be, they couldn't make it illegal to be, um, they couldn't make it, sorry, they couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or blacks. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt both communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know that we were lying about drugs? Of course we did. And that has had such huge implications um, for the drug possession arrests that occurs in our country. Like I said, you can see the figures here. I was actually surprised that there's, you know, obviously more arrests for drug possession than there is even for the sale and manufacturing of drugs. So it was very targeted, and this offense on drug use itself really has had huge costs, as I said, not just to the individuals, um, their families, but um, to our whole country.
and this war on drugs with the increase in incarc incarceration, the estimates are that it oops that it will take even on even to 2091, we will still not get down to, back to you know pre-war on drug numbers. And that I don't think that the American people understand, and that a lot of our taxes go towards this really um, it was just for pol political play. So really, when we come back to um, you know, drug policy, the drug policy for all of us who work with substance use disorder, and obviously the drug policies that lead to people being in prison for substance use was really the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. And you know, it combined all of the previous dr federal drug laws and everything basically under one um, umbrella. Um, and it served as the foundation, the legal foundation for the federal um, fight, quote unquote, for a war on drugs. And really what the DEA's um, aspect of drug policy is, was really scheduling of drugs so they could see which drugs were, quote unquote, you know, the most dangerous and therefore, you know, people should be locked up. And there are many factors what they, they considered in scheduling um, these drugs. And now we, you know, they schedule these drugs into five different schedules from the very, um, what they consider to be extremely, uh, uh, a drug of extremely high abuse potential with no um, accepted medical use down to, you know, medications that are, have the least potential. Um, and you can see some of the, 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 the examples of substances in these classes. It was interesting coming back to Nixon and, you know, the administration about um, marijuana and heroin, these were considered, and so cannabis is considered a schedule one drug with the highest abuse potential with quote unquote, no medical use. And that's something obviously that we can, um, uh, you know, have a conversation on since obviously some of the drug policies are changing. This also, the act also in terms of this criminalization of the possession and legal use of drugs, you know, is that really um, um, lent to this mandatory sentencing and lengthened prison time for low level drug use. And it, I was shocked, you know, looked at numbers in terms of the amount of people who are incarcerated and even daily um, in, the, in the US. And so much so that, you know, it says that drug possession continues still to be the number one arrest in the United States with you know, over a million arrests per year. Um, this was a pretty sobering number by Udi Offer um, at the UC, UACLU Justice Division that every 25 seconds, a person's arrested for possessing drugs for personal use with black and brown people disproportionately targeted with over policing. And this, you know, it's shocking that you know, for me, the US is an amazing country and quote unquote, we're supposed to be civilized and so on, but yet still the United States lead um, incarceration compared to so many other countries, including countries like China and Russia, you know. So that is, you know, horrible when you consider that at the same time, as I showed you, tr substance use has increased, um, overdose deaths have, has skyrocketed. And in fact, the majority of people, irrespective of, of you know, political party, think that the war on drugs is a failure. So, you know, how do you reform? And so that's one of the things that many people are, you know, discussing. And obviously states like Oregon has begun to, to deal with some of these reforms in large part, you know, can you um, decriminalize? And we see that for cannabis use around the country, about 21 states have, have had some sort of, of um, legalization of cannabis. Um, you know, some people want to legalize completely all drugs, not just cannabis use. They others want to legalize the manufacturing, the distribution, and the sale. Basically, trying to like um, replicate Portugal. And you know, a lot of this is framed in terms of this the drug policy reform is framed under the you know the the light of the right to privacy and the right to individual freedom. So, as a person who studies substance use disorder, I mean. I think a lot of people, when you think about um, drug policies in the U.S. and how we, you know, how we respond to that, it's to think about what is this, you know, 
um, both if you look into general Webster Dictionary or the National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, they characterize addiction as a chronic disease. And it's a chronic disease, you know, obviously um, it's about drug seeking behavior, compulsive use, um, difficulty to control use despite harmful consequences. It's also a clinical disorder. And this is what I think a lot of people think, oh, you know, they're just this or just that. This is a clinical disorder in the diagnostic manual DSM-5, um, you know, there are significant um, criteria that have to be met in um, establishing and um, being diagnosed with a, with a substance use disorder. Of the 11 criteria, they, they kind of break down in terms of impaired control, you know, social in, impairment, risky use, and uh, other pharmacological indicators, for example, tolerance or withdrawal. And there you are, you're, you're classified and are diagnosed into mild, moderate, or severe, depending on the number of criteria um, that you fit into. So what is the neurobiology of substance use disorder? And, you know, obviously, I'm going to be biased about some things. I'm going to show different things um, and be very general and hope that we, like I said, you know, have a discussion, a conversation about all of this. Um, substance use disorders or the pharmacological actions, especially of, of substances that are addictive, have been studied a lot in a lot of preclinical research and clinical studies, especially now as neuroimaging has, has um, improved. So we, we have learned a lot. We know that many substances are abused. We know certain neurobiological circuits and especially many people from in the beginning because many people thought about addiction, quote unquote, as a disorder of reward, and it's not. But that's what framed you know, the focus initially on the neurotransmitter um, dopamine because dopamine is very critical for all aspects of our reward or more so about reward prediction. And so people studied um, this pathway a lot in substance use disorders. And of course, it's, it does play a, a, an important role. And especially during the, the acute use of the drug where dopamine levels go up um, with use and people feel euphoric and then it goes down. Um, when the drug goes down in the brain body, they feel dysphoric. But it's much more complicated than that. Um, substance use disorder, I would say, is a whole brain disorder, even though there are, of course, certain circuits that are, are more recruited or are offline. And, and I don't think the brain is ever quiet, but is, is dampened during certain um, phases of the substance use disorders. But every neurotransmitter practically plays a role, not just dopamine. We know that there are certain um, neural, um, there are certain brain regions that are particularly relevant to certain features of substance use, for example, again, the acute use, this is the ventral striatum nucleus accumbens, where you get activation when um, substances are used. But one of the things that we also see with after all these years of studying substance use disorders is that it's a disorder of great plasticity in the brain. So, you know, these are spines on, 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 uh, I'm, Freezing, I think a little bit. Hopefully, I'm okay. And I just saw that I was freezing. Um, can you still hear me? Okay, good. Um, so we know that um, substance use disorders are disorders of, like I said, extreme plasticity, where the synaptic, the, the communication between cells, how these spines grow or not on these cells, that actually changes even the the structure of the brain in substance use disorders. A lot has been um, investigated regarding some of these circuits. And you know, the classic um, schematic picture from George Kube and Nora Volkov, who respectively are the directors of the, the National Institute on Alcohol and National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, 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 George Kube and Nora Volkov, like I said, where they characterize some of the key features that, you know, after a lot of research has shown that are you know, very important for substance use disorders, such as these higher um, order cortical regions um, that regulate the subcortical structures, such as the basal ganglia in this ventral striatal area that talked to, said about reward, while the dorsal striatum is very important for habitual um, behavior, compulsive behavior, and also areas called the extended amygdala, 
um, that are really important for emotional regulation. Now, they frame it, and many people frame it as well, and here they frame it into three stages of substance use disorders. There are many others, but the acute use of the drug that produces the intoxication, um, as I said, you know, very much so into the striatum, but when most people are not on the drug constantly, they're in withdrawal, they're craving. And this negative affect drives a lot of the behavior that they then this preoccupation with them seeking the drug. And that's the interplay between the, the cortex and the, the subcortical structures. So if you look at substance use disorders, the challenge we have is that it's, the into it's the the relationship of these um, structures so that you have reduction of the prefrontal cortical um, function and an inhibitory control at the same time when you're having the um, increased um, I would say um, not just for activation because it's more than activation but increased um, salience of certain subcortical structures as the amygdala in terms of emotional regulation and um, the the substance use memories and even the environmental memories that trigger the craving. And this cycle is what really is substance use. Substance use is not about reward. It's about these really strong aspects of negative withdrawal, negative affective states that even this negative urgency that makes people actually with a substance use disorder extremely vulnerable to when you have um, extremely negative affect. And this is one of the, the challenges. And I have this old picture of, you know, why these brain regions have, uh, why it's so important to understand substance use disorders as a brain disorder, as a psychiatric disorder. Because these are pictures of uh, someone that have, for example, um, lesions of their, um, their orbital frontal cortex. And the orbital frontal cortex is really critical for integrating um, uh, sensory limbic regions to guide decision-making behavior. And when people have a lesion here, they have poor decision-making, poor impulse control, emotional ability, and rapid discounting of rewards. And that basically is what someone with a substance use disorder shows. So, we can see here that um, this is just give examples periodically, just showing redu oh, reduce. I don't know what happened. Reduced gray matter in the frontal cortical area that actually negatively correlates with the duration of opioid use. So we know that substance use, not just opioids but other substances, impact on this prefrontal cortical area, cause, leading to this aspects of reduced inhibitory control. We also have, this is, these are in um, fMRI images of um, during reward where you see this increased activation of the nucleus accumbens very strongly. But even some of the old studies, in the first studies that started to, with neuroimaging showed that, for example, here, um, you see activation of the nucleus accumbens that really correlated with the rush the person reported um, experiencing. And in the amygdala, it correlated with their craving measures. So, uh, you know, and these studies have been um, replicated, you know, in different ways. Is everything replicated? No, there are certain nuances that are, are clear and there are a lot of individual differences that are important to consider. So the question is why doesn't, you know, what is it about certain individuals that makes them much more vulnerable to substance use um, disorders. And that comes in, you know, for many, many factors relevant to understanding. Um, well, that's our whole thing in terms of trying to understand the neurobiology of, of these individuals. And when we think about substance use disorders, you know, it's very different from, say, someone having a neurological disorders like Huntington, where if you have like the genetic risk, you're gonna get the, not the genetic risk, if you have the genetic um, uh, mutations, you will get the disorder. With substance use disorders, you do have to take the, ex be exposed to the drug, but so many things make, put you at risk. And a number of the things that put you at risk is actually the neurodevelopmental processes. 
we now know from studying the neurodeveloping, uh, the, the, sorry, and studying the developing brain, that there are so many features that lend themselves to making one much more vulnerable to addiction. Environmental factors are huge aspects. Not, I mean, yes, post um, uh, postnatally, but even prenatally as well. But the stress, impoverished conditions, and early drug exposure, as I said, the genetics makes a, a big difference. And the combination of the genetics and environment, um, they overlap on a, a biological system called epigenetic mechanisms. And we can go into that. And of course, many people know about, you know, now, but a lot of epigenetics. And that contributes to the behavioral traits and the psychiatric comorbidity. But as I said, it's a substance use that is really critical for what we see on a molecular level, what we see in certain circuits that are recruited in, under certain conditions of substance use, and even on the cellular level of their morphology. So I'm gonna take just a few of these and just go over um, some of the points. So um, just to drive home that, you know, what do we kind of know, think we know? There's a lot to, to learn and a lot that we don't know. But in terms of environment, as I said, one of the key things that I think many people do not pay enough attention to is the aspect of the developing brain. And at every level when it's studied, early life trauma, early life stress really enhances addiction risk. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, witness, witnessing violence, all contributes. This was a study I um, did with my colleague Yoko Namora many years ago. Ours is a small study. There are so many studies that, well, ours was big in number, but I mean, um, there are so many studies that have shown this, but I just use ours because obviously I'm biased. But in looking at the data um, across the country of the age of initiation of drug use in relation to childhood abuse, adults with a history of childhood abuse always with this huge, um, very significant increase in the, the age, the earlier age of onset of reuse and other people have you know, shown the severity of substance use and so on. So what does it mean for the brain? So I'll take, going back to the structure I showed you before the orbital frontal cortex. And we can see that in a number of studies, oops, my, I don't know, my, my computer is being a little bit strange and being, um, uh, slow and fast, <laughs> I don't know what's happening. But we can see here my colleague, um, Karen Baki at Sinai, in studying adults with a childhood trauma and looking at those who have a cocaine use disorder, um, showed a significant reduction in the orbital frontal cortex, especially in those individuals that had high um, childhood um, uh, trauma. And it correlated the, the structural um, changes in the, the, in the cortex correlated like with their depression. And, and a new study, and uh, a, a more recent study looking at over 500 people showed the same thing, that the, the volume of the frontal gray matter really related to the amount of trauma, er, early childhood trauma. And yet other studies have also shown that childhood trauma predicted shorter relapse to drug use and even the severity of relapse. And they also did imaging with that. So they could see that the gray matter reduction related to the severity of relapse. So the developing brain is really sensitive and we can see even you can um, dissociate some of uh, the substance use even from the early childhood trauma and show that early childhood trauma even has a stronger effect on the brain than substance use. Another thing about environment that was very interesting comes to, um, again, here, Nora Volkov did some uh, you know, seminal studies when neuroimaging first started and looking at here neurochemicals in the brain, not fMRI for functional activity, but here looking at um, index of dopamine tone in the brain. And a classic thing looking at the receptors that the dopamine T2 receptors, a particular subtype of the dopamine, um, the, the, the different subtypes of dopamine receptors. Here, she showed that in cocaine users, the dopamine D2 was reduced, but so in other um, disorders, such as methamphetamine users, alcohol use, also um, uh, heroin, and people have even seen it with cannabis. So we know that the dopaminergic system is significantly impacted um, by 
most substances of abuse, not just in the animal models that had initially showed this, but even in humans. But this reduced dopamine D2 receptor is interesting from an environmental point of view. And my NADOR and his team, uh, Morgan et al., did also a very seminal study in non-human primates. And they just did imaging of these animals. And they could see that if you measured the dopamine D2, when they were individually housed, their dopamine D2 levels looked a certain way. And then they, they put them in, in a social context. And, and primates, just like human, non-human primates, just like humans, when they're socially housed, one group will become dominant and one group will become subordinate. And it was interesting that the dopamine D2 receptors differed depending on who was dominant and who was subordinate. So the subordinate animals showed this reduced dopamine D2, just like you see in humans that have a substance use disorder. And they were the ones that self-administered more cocaine when all of them were given free access to it. So for me, when I think about what we know about aspects of neuroscience in regard to how the drug policy and the criminal justice system is, I'm, it, it's very baffling for me. And I'll tell you why. So as I said, you know, early life trauma and even, well, extreme trauma, even as a, an adult, um, produces significant effects on the brain that I just showed you. So trauma is, 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 is huge. And this incarceration of people for the drug policy, it wasn't just to punish. Many people thought of it as to quote unquote treat addiction by now making them go cold turkey. But I just showed you, you know, one of the things that we also know is that there's an incubation of the cue reactivity, um, the environmental cues that trigger craving and, and, and relapse. And so a lot of times, especially in these jails where people are actually there for just a few months, they then are released in the most vulnerable time for, their, for, their, for them to relapse. Also, I said, you know, obviously the environmental cues. We know that um, here, this is the drug use severity and, and the withdrawal, um, withdrawal symptoms increase due to this as, um, um, and you can, sorry, I should say, you can see this here, this yellow, this green dot, I don't know if you're seeing is the amygdala. We can see that the brain um, cue reactivity to environmental cues are extremely um, activated and especially as the withdrawal severity um, increases. So we're putting people at the greatest risk for relapse. And another important thing is that unfortunately, many people lose their tolerance to the drug because as people use drugs, the receptors in their brain that um, would um, detect the drugs that with repeated use, they, they will internalize often these receptors. And when they are now you know, um, locked up or so on, these receptors um, lose their tolerance. And so when they come out and they relapse because of all these things, these environmental cues, these, you know, the incubation craving, then um, they uh, will overdose. And we do see that overdose deaths are indeed higher among formerly incarcerated people than in the general public. So the question is, um, you know, what kind of, at least for me, thinking about what kind of drug policy reform as it, many people are looking for in terms of, you know, so yeah, decriminalization. Can decriminalization, in, instead of shifting the focus on imprisonment to treatment and recovery services, and in fact, drug treatment is much more cost effective than incarceration. And drug treatment has been shown to reduce crime. We know that a one size type of treatment model does not work, that one size fits all treatment model because of individual differences of environment, early life effects, you know, biological sex, genetics, and so on. But there are opportunities for harm reduction. And for me, I really think that one of the things that the neurobiology tells us is this aspect of the withdrawal period, craving, and the environmental cues that indeed trigger a lot of the continued cycle of abuse. So the development of really true 
anti-craving -medica anti medications to me is, is key. So one of the things for that for me in terms of drug reform and a huge part of my research program relates to cannabis. And it's again, you know, very shocking what, what has happened in this respect because, you know, we went from our society talking about reefer madness to this aspect of now liberate marijuana in the 1970s and now obviously even more so. But again, this war on drugs led to the fact that um, over 30% of drug arrests were for marijuana in this country. And I mean, again, shocking um, that there's a, a one marijuana arrest every minute and a half. I just can't believe that this is what we use our, our law enforcement to do. And the racial disparities in marijuana possession arrests is, is also ridiculous, where here it was a, this study and others have shown even greater that Black people are about near 3.4 times more likely to be arrested than whites. So is it really, you know, why are we, um, why are we doing this? What was this war? So now we have this crossroad of this pendulum shift from reefer madness, it's horrible, um, you know, to now it's like, you know, there's no harm, um, it's healthy, everybody says it's organic, and, you know, people tell me that cannabis is not addictive, in fact now that it's a wonder drug, that it reduces opioid mortality, which always cracks me up because that's part of our study that we were the first to show that is actually CBD. It's not cannabis, it's CBD that could reduce opioid craving. But it's also to be balanced on the side of, you know, addiction risk and the impact on the developing brain, the potent drugs that have now high um, THC, psychosis, negative affect, and so on. But even with this debate that's going on, we now have 21 states that have already enacted measures to allow for recreational use of, of, of cannabis. So it's really important that we have big discussions on, um, on the legalization and the decriminalization. Decriminalization is one thing, legalization without any type of regulation is another. And that's one of the things for me in terms of what the brain really has research has, has taught me. One thing is that I think a lot of people always are shocked and say, oh, Yasmin, you can't get addicted to cannabis. How can there be a cannabis use disorder? I showed you the, the DSM diagnostic criteria. And in our country, we actually have more people with a cannabis use disorder than even an opioid use disorder. And this is you know, not because cannabis is more addictive. It's just that more people consume cannabis. And now with the high potent cannabis, more people are developing significant problems. One thing about cannabis use disorder is that there's a high psychiatric comorbidity with it. And that's, again, coming back to this is a psychiatric disorder. This is not a disorder that people should just be locked up for. And when we look at neurobiological alterations and neuroimaging studies and so on, I'm not going to go through the details of that, we see neurobiological alterations that actually are very similar to what you see with other substances of abuse. You see the same things in like the orbital frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex. You see the similar things in the amygdala. You see similar things in the striatum. You see similar things. Here, this was just, a, I, I thought, a really one study where, um, again, cues, environmental cues. Here's the cannabis odor cues that actually when it increased craving, you could see specific circuits that are activated and it correlated to the amount of their, their craving. So when people say that you can't develop a cannabis use disorder, that's a problem. Also the fact that now cannabis odor is everywhere and, <laughs> and you have people being inundated with these cues constantly. And that is a very big challenge. One of my biggest um, concerns regarding the legalization of cannabis without regulation, I definitely believe in, in decriminalization, is about the developing brain. And the, one of the things about um, my concern 
is, and it starts for obviously my own research, is that we studied the endocannabinoid system. We studied during neurodevelopment, in particularly prenatal and adolescent development. And the endocannabinoid system is critical for many different features of neurodevelopment from even when the sperm met the egg, <laughs> the endocannabinoid system is essential at that initial point. And it's important for um, the for the new cell um, uh, development, glial, the migration of the cells, program cell death um, that's critical for forming the connectivities. And even during adolescence, when the final um, the, the final maturation of like the prefrontal cortex and synaptic pruning, the endocannabinoid system plays a, a critical role. We have looked in the brains of, of, of fetuses whose mother smoked cannabis. We have seen significant changes relevant to showing as um, that animal work had shown that, you know, um, that you have structural related changes in the brains um, as a consequence of prenatal cannabis exposure. We also though, and then we use animal models to go into, to look at behavior long-term to, in order to try and get a sense about what may be happening in, in humans, we've been looking at placenta. So the placenta of women who use cannabis or placenta of women who are ex exposed to extreme stress. And we could see that the immune, um, gene expression, the transcriptome in the placenta is significantly altered in the placenta of women who use cannabis. And it actually predicted the, and the kids' anxiety um, behavior, or this is a showing um, the gene expression changes in the placenta. It also um, was associated with increased stress hormones in the children later in life. And, and these are um, clinical scores, like I said, showing that um, these, these kids showed increased anxiety, increased aggression, and so on. Oops. And as I was saying, and the, the placental transcriptome predicted their kids' anxiety behavior later in life. So they have a significant impact. So our study got a lot of attention in the media, but it wasn't to, to penalize women because this is what happens often. You will see that woman is arrested for smoking during pregnancy or, um, or, or you know, for breastfeeding while smoking. Yes, our studies show that there's a significant impact on the, can have a significant impact on, on the offspring. But if you're gonna arrest women for that, our study also showed a very important thing, that there was a synergistic interaction between cannabis and stress. So the women that had excessive stress, that was where you could see the anxiety off the charts for their kids. So much so that even the, you know, the earlier um, um, onset of these um, behavioral um, disorders. So, you know, are we gonna lock women up for the stress that is in society? No. So the thing is that it's about knowledge and how do we help the children earlier on than later? So these are studies from um, B.J. Casey and Somerville for a long time ago, classic studies showing that the developing brain in children and adolescents actually are very different because there is this, you know, the, the prefrontal cortical top-down regulation doesn't gain full maturity until adulthood. And, but the subcortical structures that mediate emotional regulation are much higher, especially during adolescence and hence why you see that adolescents are much more sensitive, for example, to, for reward. And as I said, you know, this classic, the pioneering work um, by um, Geed and his colleagues showing that the, in fact, the prefrontal cortex doesn't really reach full adult maturity till even um, mid twenties. This has been a, a huge debate as to does cannabis during adolescence exposure really impact the brain. And groups have shown that, yes, you can see structural changes in terms of cortical thickness. Um, you can see functional changes in terms of resting state connectivity and even during certain tasks. But they've also looked at studies with twins and, and seen that there actually may be genetic um, uh, differences in terms of why you might see structural changes. But there has been a recent, the, the 
there's a study in, in Europe that's now replicated in the US in terms of the ABCD pro um, project in the US where they're doing neuroimaging on kids starting about age nine. And the Imogen project had started a little, um, the kids were a little older, but the Imogen if, was done in Europe where they were imaging kids every two years or so on. And here they could see that indeed in correcting for a lot of the genetics and so on, that cannabis use was associated with altered cortical development. And in, and in like the cortical regions where there was rich in the cannabinoid receptor. So it definitely, um, cannabis use is not benign on the developing brain. And that's an important thing, you know, when we consider about regulation. A lot of the human studies, like I said, are very um, con contentious in a lot of groups because as I said, you see genetic um, associations and environmental associations with cortical thickness and which twin may go on to use a cannabis or not. So we can conduct cute um, animal studies and we could do the same thing. And we can give adolescent rats THC and study them as adults. And we see similarly that this, this is looking at, now looking at uh, you know the neurons themselves, that the complexity of the neurons are different. And you can see the difference here in this, um, the right panel. And interestingly, how the complexity differs in terms of spine, the, the spine, um, uh, the, the dendritic trees, and that's the communication that talks to other cells and, and cognitive and for in, enhanced cognition, those changes actually resembled um, stress when there's pure stress in the brain. We are able to um, pick up these cells with a laser and we wanted to, I wanted to know what was in these cells, what was happening, and we can sequence them and look at thousands of genes. And the thing that was really shocking was that the, the, the normal developing adolescent brain into young adulthood differed dramatically in those that had been exposed to THC. Only, they only overlapped about 5%. And where they changed were related to biological systems, yes, of, of morphology, so the structural changes that we saw, but also of this epigenetic mechanisms. And epigenetic mechanisms are really very important for substance use disorders. Yes, we know genetics play a role, but epigenetics is really critical, especially for this complex disorder of, uh, as addiction, because epigenetic is, allows the environment to actually control gene activity. So you inherit the DNA sequence from your parents, but the environment, um, whether stress, many different things, including substance use, can put tags on your DNA. And there are many different types of epigenetic mechanisms. And these tags can either force part, force part of the DNA to be open, that should be closed, and vice versa. And these epigenetic mechanisms we could see had significantly changed in the, in the neurons in the cortex of these animals with adolescent THC exposure so much so that there was this huge reorganization compared to um, normal vehicle animals. So, and a lot of the reorganization also related to biological systems we could see in the prefrontal cortex of people who were diagnosed with um, psychosis and schizophrenia. But a huge aspect of, of cannabis pollen regulations and so on, or lack of regulations for certain things is understanding the endogenous cannabinoid system in our brain. So the endogenous cannabinoid um, system or the THC, the psychoactive part of cannabis that you know, relates to the euphoria, the high, it binds to the cannabinoid receptor. And these cannabinoid receptors are really critical for regulating synaptic communication, synaptic plasticity. They are there to mediate the function of the endogenous cannabinoid ligands. They're endogenous ligands that are lipid products. And they are made on demand, but they are at very low concentrations. So when you take TH, um, cannabis, you, you, you activate these cannabinoid receptors to a certain extent. The problem that we have today is that the cannabis plant on the street is not the original plant. The original plant had about two to 4%. It now has even 
uh, 24% THC and certain products in, um, and actually in dispensaries um, even more. And the way that people can consume cannabis today, a lot of um, young adults, teens in, in dabbing and, and so on, it goes up to even over 70% THC. So it has blown out the cannabinoid receptors in the brain. So potency matters. And especially when we think about how to regulate the policies, we also know potency matters even in our animal studies. So we see that it's the high potency THC that produces the greater stress response. So this is 95 days after their last cannabis, high dose cannabis. Their cortisol, their, their stress hormone levels are still extremely elevated. When we look in their brains, for example, here, like the amygdala, the region really critical for emotional regulation, the combination of THC and stress produces a very strong effect, especially on a particular cell type. I'm not gonna go into the, the deep biology of it, but these cells that are really critical for, again, synaptic communication. And the decision-making, so we have them go through um, just like humans, and we can show that our high-dose THC produces the same cognitive behavior, cognitive deficit in risky behaviors and so on and impulsivity as human cannabis users. So we were able to compare them. And the high dose, the changes that we see in these cells are correlated to the changes in decision-making and impulsivity that we see. So I'm gonna end soon and just because I've said a few little things about this topic. So that's, I've gone through like aspects of environment, aspects of the developing brain. But another thing that is very important is genetics, as I said throughout, you know, every drug has a different addictive potential. And in terms of the risk of developing a substance use disorder after just experimenting. And actually nicotine is one of the most uh, uh, addictive uh, substances. And I don't know if people realize that, especially, you know, the, the device that it's in, the, you know, you're smoking and inhaling, but opioids are definitely, and as we showed in the beginning, um, and fentanyl, these very potent synthetic um, opioids, Cannabis now, this numbers are, are very old. We would definitely put the cannabis levels to be much higher for marijuana due to the high potency THC that's out there today. But there's also heritability of the drug itself. So the, the, you have two things, you have the drug itself and you have the heritability. And again, there are you know, opioids and, and uh, uh, stimulants may, and, and alcohol and, and nicotine have increase um, heritability compared and to certain other drugs. So that's really something that obviously individuals, you know, you, you, you don't choose your genetics. And imaging studies have been able to show, for example, again, that, you, that there are uh, differences in the brain regions and those circuits that I've talked about in terms of the, the prefrontal cortical circuits to the striatal circuits in terms of people who, have a, who are stimulant users here for this particular study. And it can show that even, um, you know, that the familial risk with the genetics also plays a role in how these, these neural circuits are connected. So the genetics plays a big role there. Here, just, some, it's just quick to say, even our studies, when we first started looking at the human brain, um, because many people were dying of opiate use, um, of opiate overdose, and we were studying, doing molecular studies in their brains to understand what was, you know, the changes there. And we could see that a variant of the myopic receptor where the morphine, the metabolite of heroin and so on binds, that it, it actually made a difference. And it made a difference on a functional level that people had seen in cell cultures in these, um, um, in, in, in the lab. But we actually could see that in our population, that the people that had this um, particular polymorphism of their mupid receptors, nearly 90% of them were opiate users. That is, you know, can't be, um, it can't be, you know, just an accidental thing. And here, and this was actually when I was in Sweden and uh, European population. And then here, when I went to Mount Sinai, we could see that clinical severity of people who overdosed in our, in our um, emergency department also the genetics made a, um, of the myopic receptor made a difference. 
now, you know, our studies are small. Um, we're looking at, you know, neurobiological implications. Here, these are now looking at thousands of people to really try to see if, you know, they can get any um, hint about what genetic associations there might be here with opiate use disorder. And once again, interestingly, finally, they were able to see a signal that's now reproduced in, again in the myopic receptors as OPRM1. And there were even certain variants of the myopic receptor that was helpful for determining the dose of even methadone treatment for people. So this is one of the things, that, again, that's really important in understanding the relevance of genetics. And of course, we, we know how it impacts on the mu receptor function, that it's not that people are um, bad. This is what is happening in the brain. So what happened, I'm just gonna end in send of like, when we studied the postmortem human brain, what did we see? And the thing that, you know, we can look at thousands of genes. Some genes are increased, some genes are decreased. This is what the, you know, this volcano plot is called. And, you know, sometimes you don't, depending on the sample size, you don't have to be a computational biologist to see that, you know, people who use heroin are different from those who use um, the controls. But the thing that was fascinating for me was that a huge part of the, the, the dysregulation that we see in the brains of opioid users relates to synaptic plasticity, just as we saw with cannabis, but and also epigenetic mechanisms. And that is one of the foundations why we're, we're developing for treatments. But when we look at everything that I, you know, I'm trying to, and to you know, we look at the drug use induces these epigenetic changes in plasticity that we can see translated into synaptic plasticity into these neuronal circuits that impact on their behavioral traits. And those behavioral traits can increase their addiction risk, increase psychiatric comorbidity, and increase the, you know, the diagnostic, um, all of those criteria of inhibitory control um, being Im impacted, um, reward sensitivity impacted, negative affective state impacted. The developing brain is a huge part of that. And genetics definitely plays a role, but the environment and one thing that is really huge is trauma and stress. And so many parts of our drug policy, this trauma and stress is a huge um, part that even exacerbates their natural um, vulnerability. So I will end by saying it's complex. <laughs> I wish I had an answer, but I will say one answer that we have is that the profound epigenetic changes that we see in the brain is actually an optimistic thing for me because unlike genetics, epigenetics uh, mechanisms are reversible. So what we're doing is trying to develop medications that can speak to that. It is not many people, including people who suffer from substance use disorders themselves, they've bought into the stigma even that quote unquote, once an addict, always an addict. The brain science begins to tell us that may not be true. These mechanisms are absolutely reversible. It's just that where we are today in our science, in our medicine and technology, to reverse it, we it has certain toxic things that we're still working on. So these are some of the things that I end with in terms of you know, my thought about neuroscience and drug you know, reform policy is first and foremost, it's a psychiatric disorder. And I just don't understand how you imprison for self-harm. So that was the first thing. The first thing of the war on, on drugs was not really um, reflective of the fact that they knew it was a psychiatric disorder. A number of people told them just, Possessing a drug in your hand, it's like saying somebody's going to arrest me because I have a hamburger. And, you know, that to me is the level of what this is. And incarceration exacerbates the disorder. Incarceration does not help in any way, shape, or form to treat the disorder. So we need treatment, but it can't be a treatment of this one size fits all. It has to be consideration of individual differences. And early intervention is essential and the earlier the better and in especially in the context of 
sustained um, intervention, positive environmental in intervention, mindfulness and things like that. And early on in life, we can show that there are aspects that improve mental health outcome. That to me is something, absolutely. Research in terms of still, you know, essential evidence-based programs and evidence-based treatments and educating people really, I think, you know, I hear so many ridiculous things, especially about even cannabis. That's one of the things that we must make sure that our society is educated, but not about this is your drug, an egg, and this is your, you know, your, 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 your brain on, on drugs. It's not. And we, education is also critical for reprogramming our society that really are the stigma stems from the 1970s and this misinformation that, you know, this drug policy and the war on drugs um, carried out. But there needs to be sen sensible regulation. People shouldn't be arrested for possessing drugs. They need help. If they commit a crime, yes, they go to, you know, prison and hopefully improve treatments and accessibility to treatments there. But we need to have sensible regulation that really ensures safety and oversight because, you know, drugs do impact and can harm the brain. So with that, I'm going to stop um, and let's see, take questions. I don't remember what my last slide probably was.